things off to uh, Susan Berger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you back. And I have a few slides, and then I'll turn this over to Rachel. There's a one more session for this um, course, and it's June 5th. So you have a month to catch up on things if you're not caught up. Right now, it looks like uh, maybe 40 uh, to 60 of you are hoping to get a badge. Remember, if you get the Credly badge, you have to listen to all the webinars and do the assignments. And um, you don't have to listen to the webinars live, and I will get that stuff. Um, so if you have any problems, you can contact me. This is my email address. And um, if you have a query about the course uh, content, use the discussion uh, tab in the education website. To keep uh, in contact with what's going on with Connecting to Collections Care, you should join the Connecting to Collections Care community. and. You can find the instructions on how to join in on our website. And you can join us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, there are May Day prizes going on all throughout the end of the week, so check those out. I mean, the end of the month. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a really interesting free webinar on Herbaria. So if you have time, you might check that out. And in July, we're going to have a, a, another course on making the most of assessment. So uh, look forward to that. You can register for it now. Um, and if you need help with collections and you're in the United States and you have an emergency, this is the 24-hour hotline, hotline for uh, help from the AIC. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to um, Rachel. Hmm. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I am going to uh, jump into things um, quickly. I seem to be having trouble advancing. <clears throat> there we go. OK. Um, as, uh, as Mike said, today is the fifth webinar out of um, uh, six in our reorg uh, online course. And today um, you're going to be hearing from me, um, Susan Timulovich, uh, who is the executive director of the New London Maritime Society. And then we're going to throw it all back to uh, Simon Lambert, who is going to um, <clears throat> take, us, take us on. Uh, but I wanted to sort of review the objectives by the end of the sixth webinar, the one that will take place after our um, on-site uh, day working with the New London Maritime Society. Uh, you who are doing this uh, you know, um, in your own institutions along with us will have developed a basic reorg plan to improve collections access and care in one of your storage rooms. So um, the goal is to, to have, you know, have you be walking through this process and feel comfortable um, you know, starting off on uh, a reorg of your own. Um, so today's objective for, um, for our, our fifth webinar is uh, we're going to be looking at the New London Maritime Society as a reorg angels case study. And um, we're going to review the reorg phases. Um, Simon will uh, help uh, anticipate some of the bottlenecks that um, we are, are, might foresee for our work next week on site. Um, and uh, we're going to recognize the steps required in preparing a reorg project chart. So that's uh, the focus uh, for today. I want to remind you, if you haven't already, uh, please do go onto the uh, reorg website um, on the ICROMS website and download the, the workbook, the worksheets, and the additional resources. Uh, they really do complement uh, and, and sort of underpin everything that we've been doing here online. And um, I, I think actually they make really, um, really easy, uh, clear reading. Um, we also want to remind you that if you have carried out a reorg project in your institution and you're interested in working with others, 
that um, there is an opportunity to be trained um, more fully in the reorg methodology. Um, that program that will be occurring in August in India uh, has an application form that is available online um, for you to check out. So um, let's uh, do a short recap of, um, of last week's webinar. Uh, last week we looked at some of the questions that you need to answer as you develop your reorg plan. Questions like, what are you storing? What materials do you have available or can acquire? Can you standardize or simplify some of your storage solutions? What skills do you or your staff have? And these uh, address the checklist items that are part of the phase one and phase two of the reorg methodology. So that would be, oh, let's see. There we go. So we've sort of, you know, um, again, not fully covered everything that you will see in the, in the workbooks, um, but the, the material that we've covered in the, the past uh, several webinars um, really focuses in on phase one and phase two. Uh, the next thing that um, we covered last week was Rebecca reviewed Reorg's 12 categories for classifying objects, and she shared some tips for each of these categories. Uh, we also suggested that you can use the Reorg Tumblr site um, and the Stash C website to browse ideas for each of these collection types. We stress that there is never only one solution for storage and rehousing. The best solution will be both practical and safe for your circumstances and that your reorg project may allow you to go back and address additional risks or needs over time once you've, you've created space and have better access to your collection. So reorg isn't necessarily the end of the, the process of what you might need to do in storage, but it should be um, a glorious new beginning. We discussed a range of materials that are optimal for long-term storage. We also recommended using your best materials in the most sensitive collections, as well as some cheaper substitutes for tight budgets. So today, we're going to focus on how to translate all the worksheets and plans that are recommended in phase one and phase two into an action plan for phase three. We will use as our case study the planning that we have done for our mini reorg project that will take place next week at the New London Maritime Society. So this is also a reminder that if you are in the Connecticut area and want to join us on Monday the 13th, uh, please let Ruth Seiler um, in the AIC office know by tomorrow so she can add you to the list. The Foundation for Advancement and Conservation, uh, known as FAIC, which is the foundation associated with the American Institute for Conservation, sponsors a volunteer project each year in conjunction with the annual meeting. These one-day community service events have been called Angels Projects, although a name change is under evaluation for the future. We thought that using Reorg as the framework for this year's project would allow us to see the methodology put into action and foster collaboration and linkages between the Reorg and Stash C sites. That was sort of the, the basis for um, the idea of this course and, and our Angels Project Day. Um, after discussing our goals for a reorg and SAIC community service collaboration with several institutions in the Connecticut area, where AIC's 2019 meeting will be held next week, we determined that the New London Maritime Society provided the best fit. Um, I'd like to introduce now the Society's director, Susan Tamilovich, to give a brief overview of her institution. And then after that, I'll discuss a bit about what I saw during my brief site visit during our initial planning stage. And then Simon will discuss our subsequent planning for the reorg day next week. So Susan, please take it away and tell us more about the New London Maritime Society. Well, first I'd like to say how thrilled I am that uh, we were selected for this project. It's a very small, um, you know, it's a custom house, which is run by the uh, Customs, now Customs and Border Patrol. It is a building that was designed in 
1833 by the country's first uh, American-trained architect. He studied with Thomas Jefferson, Robert Mills. So it's, I would say, the um, most significant architectural building in the area. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful little building. And it's been run as a custom house all of this time. <clears throat> that's not my picture. Oh, well, my, uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's where we're located. I guess this was put in to show you exactly where we are. We're on the waterfront, um, Long Island Sound. Here we are. No, actually, we're, we're in, this is not correct. We're in Connecticut on Long Island Sound. I don't know why that's that way, but there is another Custom House Maritime Museum in Newburyport, so that must be what that is showing. The three cust there are three Custom Houses, one in Newport, one in New Bedford, one in Newburyport, and one in New London. They were all built uh, with versions of the same plan by Robert Mills in 1833. So here's an early picture of our building. It, o it actually opened in 1835. And we have all the letters for the construction process. And in 1836, they wrote a letter saying that water was coming in from the roof in buckets. So it has had a serious leakage problem all these years. That's um, almost uh, 200 years. In uh, 1983, uh, New London, which had been the second busiest whaling port in the world for several decades, including when it was built in 1835, um, was now a little bit of a backwater, and customs wasn't very busy, so they decided to sell this building. The citizens rallied. They formed the New London Maritime Society and uh, took over the building and made it into a maritime museum. So Customs said, well, since you're going to keep the building open, we'll keep an office. So in fact, we're the longest continuously operating Customs House in the country. and. Uh, after all these years, last year, we finally fixed the four interior gutters. If you look at the, there's a gutter coming right down on the corner next to that plaster. And it actually um, snakes inside the gutter where it is packed in concrete and granite. And uh, it turns out that the copper gutter inside the granite and concrete had been freezing and thawing with ice almost 200 years. And um, the, the gutters had big cracks in them, and we were getting a lot of leaks. So we finally fixed that last year, which is quite a terrific thing. So we do a lot of, um, a lot of uh, restoration here. You know, the building was certainly not perfect. And uh, uh, do what we can. When I got here, um, 11 years ago, there had been no director for quite some time. It's a it's a community museum. It's we're trying to be serious, but it was uh, founded pretty much as a community museum. Um, we're pretty lively. We have programs for all ages. It's a nonprofit historic site, and in the last uh, six years, over the last six years, we have also taken on ownership of three local lighthouses. So that's a big deal. And you can imagine if your collections are about the waterfront and you take on three lighthouses, that meant every two years for the last six years, we've taken on a whole other uh, uh, subject that we have to present. Uh, we also preserve these lighthouses. And uh, this one in particular, the, the first one which we took on in 2009, uh, the neighbors sued us for uh, four years to stop tours to keep it private. And uh, this March, we actually won the lawsuit. And now we're able to give tours again. Because like I said, we're a community museum. We feel these are public, you know, public properties. And everybody has the right to enjoy them.
the oldest and the tallest lighthouse on Long Island Sound. Um, so here is the display where we talk about the lighthouses. Um, you can see models of the three. Um, but I want to note that when the museum started 36 years ago, there were no collections at all. We relied completely on uh, donations from the community. The lens is a, a loan from the US Coast Guard, but everything else is donated from the community. Our largest exhibit is about, um, you know, whaling is a big story, but the actual most significant story that happened here is this is where the Amistad ship came in in 1839 when our building was just opened for four years. It was a brand new building. And uh, the Amistad captives, about 53 uh, Africans who had been kidnapped and brought to Cuba, uh, overthrew the captain on their ship and uh, managed their way up the coast of the United States. And when they were intercepted and brought into a port, they were brought into New London. And they continued their battle uh, or their campaign for freedom. And they eventually won it in about uh, a year and a half. But uh, because they came into New London and one of the supporting players was a local grocer who was an abolitionist, um, the whole story is, is quite wonderful, and it's our most popular one. So that's our largest permanent exhibit. We have special uh, exhibits from time to time. Right now, we're working on one about the sailor influence, nautical influence on children's uh, clothing, toys, and entertainment, which is fun. Uh, one of my favorite, one of the most evocative uh, collection is in our hallway, and it's collections from two of our members who are professional divers. We also have a library and a library archive. Uh, the letters I mentioned from when this building was uh, constructed are all up there. And oops, sorry, I didn't turn this. The, the, um, there, there's a delay, I'm sorry. The, um, the library is run by the two former head librarians and also special collection librarians from Connecticut College. So I have to say, they have no reorg problems. They are very much on it, and everything is in acid-free papers and catalog and tremendous. But the rest of the stuff that we have is, um, is not. Uh, we're a community museum. We say small, authentic, friendly, telling the stories of the waterfront. We just do the best we can. I'm the only employee. We fix what we can, and we uh, paint it if it looks bad, <laughs> and just keep going. Um, New London itself is, is a um, depressed community. Uh, all the children get free lunches because of the high uh, poverty rate. So we don't have a lot of people walking into our museum, although we do work a lot with the schools. Um, so we have a very diversified revenue stream. And in fact, our museum shop makes more money than our uh, than the museum does itself. Uh, and there's a legacy to all this um, water, which we've just, we're actually working on a, a, a plan to replace the roof. But this was just a month ago when we had some US uh, uh, Coast Guard cadets come in. They're in the same corner that you saw in the Amistad room. They moved everything out, and they're just scraping down the paint and the plaster. Um, calcification that was on the walls because it's kind of unhealthy and looks pretty bad. So we're, we're battling on, on many fronts at the same time. Um, but one of our big uh, successes was uh, last year we actually managed to open up the lower level, which is where my office and the collections room is. But we also created, um, well, we revamped our kitchen and created a ship model gallery and replaced all the windows, which were rather punky. And uh, some even had termites uh, with new historically accurate 
uh, windows, which actually have the wavy glass in them. So we're doing restoration all the time, and uh, it's just part of the way we do things here. Um, the mission of the New London Maritime Society is to protect and to preserve New London's custom house and the three area lighthouses to promote, interpret, and celebrate the maritime life and history of the Port of New London and the surrounding region with exhibitions, educational programs, and uh, preservation initiatives. So take a look at our, our website. Um, like I said, there's only one employee, and there's only been one employee for 11 years. And before that, there were none, um, except for maybe a few years before that. Uh, so we do our best, and we're very, very, very grateful for the help we're going to get from this uh, course and this project. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think Susan's introduction provided uh, a nice uh, overview of the strengths of the institution. They have a beautiful building. Um, they have a lot of sort of community buy-in and, and, and interest with some devoted volunteers uh, in addition to, to Susan's devotion. Um, they've got some really cool stuff. Um, uh, but they also have some you know, real challenges in terms of maintaining the building. And as you see here, uh, this is um, the uh, um, self-assessment tool that we asked Susan to fill out as part of the selection process um, for the institutions that were under consideration for the reorg FAC Angels collaboration, um, and that, we've, uh, that Simon has discussed in previous webinars. The scores uh, certainly show that they're um, for the most part, in this orange band of you know you um, you need a reorg project, uh, and the category that they scored best on is the furniture and small equipment. Um, as I introduce the storage space, you'll see why. I have to say that you know in when I looked at the the scoring of this, though, I think um, you know this is this is a best case uh, scenario. Um, but the the great thing for our purposes is that we. Um, saw in Susan's institution a, um, a really good case study and, and the kinds of problems that um, we see so often uh, in small institutions of, you know, of similar size and, and resource level. So um, here's a, a little bit more about uh, the sort of snapshot that Susan put together in terms of, um, you know, the, she mentioned one staff member uh, but serving, you know, a good number of, of uh, visitors and school children, um, a, a nice uh, core group of volunteers, a collection um, of about 800 uh, pieces, but many of or most of which are not cataloged. Um, you know, things that are on exhibit, um, some for for long periods of time, others that rotate uh, on and off. Um, so I, you know, I think this kind of thing should show um, many of you that uh, that you know you are not alone if you are facing similar kinds of, of issues. So um, this is a, a floor plan of the um, basement of the Customs House building, uh, and the storage area that we're going to be focusing on today is this B2 space. Um, I took a, trip, a quick trip up there. Um, the storage building is uh, it's in the building's lower level, and um, you access it from uh, this uh, fairly narrow steep staircase. And um, so you, know, you have a, a sort of quick turn there. And um, there also is um, access out uh, this back door to um, the, the area that I think what you saw before that Susan showed the sort of nice painted um, piece with the volunteers sitting on the Bilco doors is, uh, is the rear of the institution and the ramp that leads out to this backyard um, where there is a tent for outdoor event spaces. And hopefully um, we're keeping our fingers crossed for good weather on Monday so we can use that as a swing space. Um, the B1 uh, room is Susan's uh, office. 
uh, B4 is the kitchen that she mentioned that was recently renovated. And um, B3 is uh, this other um, space that she talked about with the ship models. Um, during uh, my visit, we sort of were calling it the man cave. Um, and the hope that it'll be used for, for other kinds of community events. Um, so during our reorg day, uh, one of the advantages to, to Susan's institution was that there's actually a lot of good swing space um, for us to move around and uh, do our mini projects in. Uh, Mike and Susan, can we show the short video um, here? Maybe, you know what, let's see if we can hold that off. Um, maybe I'll show a few more slides, and then we'll, um, it might make the video a little bit easier to understand. Um, when you come down from the staircase, uh, and then you would sort of turn right, uh, the slide here on the left is the corridor that leads to the storage room. This is what you could see. Um, so you have all this brickwork, um, these uh, uh, vaulted um, ceilings, and a lot of um, material here in the, the hallway. Um, and on the right, this is the, um, the door to the storage space. Um, there's, there's material that sort of makes it challenging even to, to get in. And this floor plan is the society's main storage room and the first of the type of floor plans that we've discussed in the previous webinars. And so again, this is the space that's going to be the focus of our discussion today and our work next week. So when you first open the door, um, this is sort of your, your initial view. You can see it's uh, you know, pretty full. And then if you're standing sort of right uh, inside the doorway, uh, the slide on the left is your view if you look towards the, the left wall. Uh, and um, the slide on the right is your view if you're looking at the uh, right wall. The arch ceilings here make the space a little challenging. We don't have a fixtures floor plan, which is the second plan we've discussed in these webinars, but you can see that there's not a lot of pipes or wires going on overhead. The main issues uh, overhead is the fact that there's been some previous water damage, as Susan alluded to. Uh, and so that's resulted in some areas of efflorescence or some powdery brick dust. But, um, but hopefully that has been resolved with all the um, maintenance that has recently been done. Uh, here are um, a few views of the various types of storage furniture that um, are in use in the room. You can see a lot of these sort of slatted structures. Uh, on the, um, there is some steel shelving sort of in the, the middle of the space, up on this middle side. And then on the right, you're seeing some of these cabinets that also have these um, slots. Uh, and Susan's been able to use those for some boxes with small artifacts. The museum actually has a lot of storage furniture that has been donated or given away by other institutions like a local school and Yale University. Um, a lot of it has been squeezed into the storage room. But there's also a sub-basement, which isn't great for collections as it's below grade. And um, there's you know, potential for, for water intake, um, which did happen during Superstorm Sandy. Um, but but a space like this would be appropriate for non-collection items that maybe don't need to be um, in storage, because for the most part, this is dry and safe. So what you're seeing here are some of the additional storage pieces that the um, museum has access to that are currently in the lower level. So here's the fourth type of floor plan that Simon drew up, showing the general placement of the pieces of storage furniture as um, they're currently situated in storage. So, um, so it, it seems like this is a, a fairly reasonable um, you know, layout uh, given, given the space. But, um, but it doesn't really, in practice, seem to be working as, as well as one might hope. Um, you can see from these images that there are things on the floor. There's a lot of overcrowding. Uh, in fact, I think the image on the right is uh, material that is outside of the storage room uh, in the hallway. And so 
here is um, Simon's occupation plan. Uh, I think it's a little, um, it's artistic, but an accurate uh, depiction of the fact that there are collections sort of all over the place, making it difficult to access anything, um, especially the pieces that are um, on sort of either, on either side uh, in those storage cabinets. Okay, let's, uh, let's see if we can get the video clip going. My husband is a TV news producer, and he would be very upset with my um, production skills on this, so you'll have to forgive me. But here Susan is uh, entering the, the storage space. And um, it's like a little buffering, but we're continuing on. So there's this sort of center block where the steel storage um, is. You've, we've got boxes of things. Some, I think there's a large frame piece or mirror. Um, and uh, there's uh, a, um, a textile or a costume piece on, on a, a sort of um, half mannequin. There's a bunch of uh, plexi bonnets. Things are stored in a variety of um, of boxes and and uh, carrier bags. In the back there, you're seeing some oversized uh, wall paintings uh, and a number of other kinds of rolled um, pieces. Some paper, some on canvas. Here, Susan is going into these um, units with the doors and um, showing that some pieces have been nicely rehoused with uh, mm -hmm. tissue and uh, you know labeled. We've tried to use um, you know as much available space with additional units on top. But as you can see, many of these things are, are sort of stacked one on top of each other, making it difficult to extract a, a piece that, um, that you might be looking for. Um, Susan's also storing some of her um, archival materials that she has here in storage. Um, and I think we've discussed that it's um, this is very common, um, but ideally we'd love to see collections and, and other valuable pieces in storage. And given that Susan does have a, a lot of space, um, that maybe we can move some of those other materials out. And I think we're pretty much what, what we wanted to, to show from that. That's perfect. Thank you, Mike and Susan. Okay. So in um, our discussions with Susan, we um, identified that uh, they have collections in nine out of the 12 reorg object categories that uh, Rebecca went over with us last week. Um, a few of them like these uh, long rolled wall paintings are, um, you know, like number two or would be considered outliers, things that are, don't form the bulk of the, the collection. And, um, you know, and sort of reviewing again the, the self-evaluation and the things that we saw, um, there, there are some, some strengths and, and uh, but the key issues that we're going to really be focusing in is that, you know, like many institutions, Susan is, is fighting the good fight on her own, but she doesn't have enough uh, resources, even if she knows, you know, what needs to be done. She's wearing many caps. Um, the building has a, a good amount of usable space, but um, it's not always uh, apportioned in, um, in a way that would maximize uh, safety for the, the collections items and access to non-collections pieces. Uh, the collection is partially cataloged. Some items have been entered into a past perfect database, but 
Susan doesn't currently have access to the file. So right now there's no tracking system. That's an advantage for us for our reorg day because we're going to be pretty much moving everything out and moving it back in. So the fact that we don't have to worry about, you know, sort of shelf level tracking is um, makes our, our uh, project easier. Um, and I think we feel that despite the fact that it looked awfully crowded, um, that there is a lot that can be done um, with that amount of space. There's a lot of storage furniture, but it isn't necessarily well suited to the, the size and type of collections that um, the society has. Um, we'd love to get things off the floor and make sure that um, that the things that are fragile and um, are you know do have some definite risk factors. Um, the kinds of things that um, are at risk for both, you know, chemical aging or um, corrosion and, and tarnishing are, um, are protected. So now I'm going to turn things back over to Simon, who's going to talk about how we take all that information we have and craft it into um, a storage action plan. Hey, thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Susan. So this is the hard part, OK? So we have, um, over the past few weeks, we've looked at how to um, analyze the situation uh, using various lenses, um, you know, using various tools to enable us to um, extract what are the key issues that we're facing in our storage areas. And so now it's like, what do we do to turn that into a work plan and to address some of these issues? So um, if you look on the right side of your screen, what I'm pointing at right now is the reorg project chart that we're going to be aiming to create at the end of this session. So you, too, will create one of these or something similar for your own project um, if you are following along in a storage area as you're taking this course. So, um, and I apologize for this scribble, but it's hard. <laughs> It's hard to actually um, draw uh, little objects in uh, PowerPoint, which is what I made these plans in. Um, and so this is the occupation plan for uh, number number four. So what you see in uh, in red is uh, non-collection. And I, I have to confess that I have not been in the space yet, so that's an additional challenge for myself. Rachel is uh, the one with the knowledge, and Susan as well, uh, of the space. Uh, but I am going off of what I was, uh, what I saw in the pictures and the videos, and all through um, throughout our various discussions. So um, this is just an indication of uh, to, to suggest that there are various uh, collection and non-collection items uh, in the space, uh, but just not. Uh, don't take the scribble as a, any kind of judgment as <laughs> to how they're being stored. Um, uh, I mentioned that I made these plans in uh, PowerPoint, and um, that might be something that you might want to do as well. Uh, I did find that I could do that quite easily um, if I click on a shape that I've created, like a rectangle, um, and I go into the Picture Tools tab in the Format section, and then you can adjust the height and width of those shapes, and um, you can just uh, so I said that basically 0 0.26 was going to be 26 inches, and 0 0.62 was going to be 62 inches. So I used that in order to create a floor plan from measurements that we had from Susan that was to scale. So it's just a very simple, like, you know, you don't need very compli complicated software in order to create floor plans that work and that enable you to play with the various uh, storage units in the space to um, develop a, a layout of your own. So I know you, most of you will have already done this because this was part of the assignment for uh, week one or two. I think we do. Um, so uh, just a reminder uh, of what Rachel said. In the space, we have a lot of collections and non-collections items that are, are mixed together. So this is going to be one of the key things we're, we're going to try to focus on in this reorg. Um, just some various views from various perspectives. So we can see a little bit of what's in there. Floor plan, as Rachel presented it, for the basement. Um, this is our storage area. And as Rachel mentioned, we have all these different areas that can uh, use the swing spaces in our project. And we also have these stairs to the outside that lead into this 
area where there will be a tent set up. And so if the weather is nice, uh, we can use uh, that area outside as a swing space, maybe for some non-collection materials or other things that we decide that we, we need some extra room for. Because we ultimately, we will be emptying most of what is in this room out uh, in order to reconfigure the space to optimize provide some better uh, storage solutions for the various types of objects. So what we're going to be focusing on for this one day reorg is going to be what we call the physical reorganization. And that's usually it's uh, the reorg, as you know uh, from the various uh, sessions we've had so far, is not only about reorganizing the space. It's also about uh, there's the management component. Uh, there's all the issues related to um, you know, vulner collection vulnerability and value. <clears throat> that also uh, come into the equation. But in order to do all of that stuff and to do all the fine, uh, detailed work that might happen uh, later down the line, we need to get access to the collection again. And as you've seen in some of these uh, slides that Rachel showed, right now it's really hard to access the actual collection. And so our primary goal for this one day um, is going to be to reestablish a safe access to the collection. And then there's a whole other things that can happen after that, after that access is, is uh, reestablished. So if we look at the, um, the 10 criteria for uh, functional storage, we can see that you know, there is one qualified member of staff who's in charge, and the key policies and procedures exist and are applied. Um, the building is, uh, provides adequate protection, and every object is free from active deterioration that we know of. And uh, we are going to be focusing on these uh, issues here, which all have to do actually with the physical reorganization. So we're going to be looking at uh, removing all the non-collection items from the space and finding a space for them that's not in the collections room. Uh, we're going to see uh, if it's possible to create some spaces um, in the semi-basement and the sub-basement in order to um, uh, store some of the storage equipment and some of the packing equipment that is currently in storage in a, an area, uh, a work area that could be better um, better meet Susan's needs. Um, and we're going to make sure that no object is placed directly on the floor, although I saw that Susan had elevated a lot of the objects onto tables or other pieces of furniture in the moment. So uh, we're just going to make sure that at the end, uh, there were some pieces directly on the floor. But we will make sure that by the end of the day, no object will be placed directly on the floor. Uh, every object will have a designated location in storage. And we will uh, make sure that every object can be accessed without moving more than two others. And we're going to be arranging objects by category. So um, our priorities for this one day reorg are going to be to relocate and discard non-collection items, uh, to develop storage systems that are better adapted to the collection's needs, uh, like I said, no objects directly on the floor, and to create a new location system for Susan so that she's able to uh, find anything in the collection. Once she's been able to do her inventory, uh, she'll be able to find any object within three minutes. I'm going to start by focusing on number two, um, which is to create storage systems that are adapted for the collection's needs. And the reason why we're starting with this uh, is because a lot of this, um, a lot of these questions are going to determine what we need in terms of equipment and supplies for the reorg. So we're kind of um, jumping ahead and seeing how we want to store things in the finished product, because that's going to help us come up with a budget and a list of things that we need in order for this to, to happen. And often, if you're going to be doing a reorg in your own institution, you often have to apply for a grant before you actually start working on your project. And so you need to be able to kind of define uh, in broad terms what you'll be needing in order to implement your projects, even before you start actually moving things. So what we've done is we've used the categories, uh, the object categories, which are there just for your information. Uh, but we're focusing here on the object types within that, those categories, because it helps us to think about how we want to store them. Um, and so we've identified that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different types of 
objects that we're going to be working with that we need to find storage solutions for. Uh, and some of them, we don't know how many we have yet. So we'll be finding that out when we start doing the work. Um, some of them, which required maybe more specialized storage solutions, like if the flags, uh, we needed to count them ahead of time because we needed to know how many boxes we were going to be needing. We needed to know how many uh, tubes we would be needing to roll the flags. Um, we needed to know how many boxes we would need for the uniforms and of what size. So we know that we have two different sizes of uniforms. We have the large and the small. So we needed to know how many boxes we needed of each type. So this is kind of, you will have recognized this a little bit. It's like the worksheet six that I introduced, um, but it's a very light version of it, which helps us just get our um, supplies list defined so that we can um, make sure that we have what we need on the day that we're doing our reorg. If we go um, object uh, type by object type, uh, we can see here in the storage area that uh, Rachel showed us that uh, we have some framed works. And they're about three feet or a meter high at the most. And most of them are actually in shelving units at the moment. Um, but we do want to revisit uh, the way that they're stored at the moment. And some of the units, for example, that are here on the right, we want to see if we can flip that unit on its side so that we're able to have the um, frames uh, not uh, stacked uh, on top of one another, as some of them are. And so we want to uh, find a way to improve this system, but using the existing shelving that's there, because it's actually quite good for this kind of object. And so we want to uh, just improve it and make it a bit safer for the collections, especially when there's more than one frame uh, in the slots. So we consider this as a minor problem because we do have a solution that we are going to work with, uh, which is to use these units. We have some flags, which um, are going to be boxed. Uh, and that's because they are of a size that it fits very nicely in a box. Uh, so we have 10 of those. And I think these are most of them are here. Uh, and um, then we have some flags that will be rolled that are currently sometimes, I'm not sure if these are the ones, but um, they uh, are larger and will not fit easily in a box. So we want to try to roll them onto tubes and a solution for that uh, rolled system. So we've already identified that we have 11 and 10 of those. And then we have some maps. And I apologize for the quality of the image, but this is the only image I could find from the video. <laughs> and so um, we have some, of, uh, th some maps that are rolled. And I suspect there's some maps also that belong to the collection that are not in the storage area and that will need to be brought back into the storage area. And we have 30 of these. So um, I think our solution for this um, um, is going to be to wrap them uh, into uh, tissue, uh, acid-free tissue, and to find um, some sort of slotted uh, unit that we can put them safely in um, uh, until there's time to process them and to perhaps package them a little bit better. Uh, we do have one day to do all of this. And so we have to be really careful about to not go too far down um, route and try to do something that's maybe too elaborate that would be really great for that kind of object, but maybe too elaborate that we end up having to abandon the project half done. So we have to really make sure that we finish everything in that one day. So that's our challenge for next Monday. Um, the uh, uniforms, we have some that are small. As you see here, some of them are on display. And these are children's uniforms. And then we have some that are maybe larger. And I suspect this is one of them. Um, and so we have six or four and six of each. There's, there's approximately 12 of them, 10 or 12 of them. And so uh, these are going to be ones that we will box uh, because they often are part of a, um, they're kind of an ensemble. So you might have uh, the jacket with the pants, with the hat, uh, with the gloves. And so we want to make sure all of that stuff is kept together, uh, which will make it easier for um, Susan and her team uh, well, her staff of one <laughs> and her volunteers uh, to, uh, to, to retrieve things from storage and use them for exhibitions. If everything is kept together, it'll be easier. And since we don't have that many, 
um, it won't be uh, taking up much more space than if we were to separate them um, into different uh, storage solutions. So that's the reasoning behind us wanting to box them together. Um, and then we have painting. We have these large paintings that are, uh, you know, 12 or 18 feet. I'm not sure. They're very, very long. Uh, and uh, they're quite, uh, so they're, they're, they're rolled paintings. And we're not sure exactly how many there are and, and how many are rolled together. Uh, this would require a lot of um, careful work and a large surface to work with. And I think we have decided collectively that we want to wrap them to protect them from dust. But we will not be unrolling these uh, because it might just uh, be a little bit too uh, extensive for the time that we have. It might require um, a conservator to be involved uh, in a kind of more uh, extensive project to do, to do that. So uh, we're going to find a, a surface where we can um, you know, wrap these paintings to protect them from the dust and leave them on the surface where they're out of the way and are not uh, being at risk of damage. But we're not going to be unrolling them or rolling them onto another support for, for that day. Uh, then we have object types. Uh, we have objects that are small uh, that can be carried in two hands, which will be um, stored on shelves. And we also have objects that are smaller that can be carried in one hand that will be also stored on shelves. So we don't know yet the quantities because it's hard to access some of these units uh, at the moment. And so as we uh, start to work in the space, we'll be able to actually empty the, the storage area uh, and group the objects by type and by size as we're taking them out. And that will then give us a better sense of how much uh, shelf space we need for each type. So we're going with the strategy that I talked about in um, webinar two, which is to use more of an intuitive uh, visual estimation method rather than measuring every single object. Um, and that works usually pretty well this kind of uh, collection size, I have to say. Larger collection than that might. Um, so what we're doing here is um, all of us who are coordinating this um, workshop that's happening next Monday is we've come up with a list of mini projects, which are basically the same, uh, you know, the same list that I just showed you. But what we're doing is we're looking at you know, what is the quantity uh, of each type, which we already have some of them. Uh, we're detailing a little bit much, you know, what, what kind of storage solution we want to use for those kinds of objects. Uh, we're starting to list what the required materials would be to implement this solution. And then we have a, a column here, which is any questions that we need to clarify with Susan. And we have had a few meetings with her on, on the phone to uh, ask her, you know, how many flags of, of this size do you have, or how many uh, uniforms do you have, or are those flags that we're seeing, are those part of the collection or not? And so uh, this is uh, what we're using as a communication tool uh, between us uh, to plan the, the workshop. So you can see it's, it's taking all of the different types that we just talked about, but just expanding a little bit more on them to uh, kind of come up. Our ultimate thing we had to do last week was to define what our list of materials was going to be because we need to ask um, we need to find we need to find those materials and so um, if we're getting some some materials donated we need to know exactly what we what we need um, so one of the big questions that gets asked is how far do we go with this physical reorganization and I think there's a tendency to think that you know after this reorg everything will be perfect everything will be ideal everything will be stored uh, you know uh, optimally and we will make a huge improvement I expect but um, so collections um, right now uh, before the physical reorg are not safely accessible uh, possible to get through the space so that's the situation right now. And we can't really, in, the, in those conditions, it's very, very difficult to do an inventory. So what we're going to work towards after our physical reorg is that collections as a whole can be safely accessed. So we're going to be able to actually see and um, see our collection in order to be able to do 
and uh, we'll avoid the main hazards, and now we can do the inventory. So um, afterwards, after our one-day reorg, there is other stuff that can happen after, of course. Like, we're going to make sure that everything is safe, but then there's detailed work, like, oh, maybe those maps, instead of just putting them on the shelves wrapped in tissue paper, it would really be nice if they had individual boxes or things like that. So those kinds of things, which will cost the, uh, the New London Maritime Society uh, money to do. Um, and so um, those things can happen afterwards. But we want to leave the space um, at least so Susan can access her collection safely and she can do her inventory, which should be the two things that happen uh, afterwards. So uh, when, where do we stop is want to, we want to stop right here. <laughs> so there's a, there's a, us who are used to working with collections, uh, you know, there's a tendency to want to uh, everything kind of in, in the ideal state. Well, we'll have to really check ourselves and make sure that we don't launch into something that we can't finish. So um, again, here are our priorities for the day. So if I have to ask you now, so if we get, if we think about the, our, our project chart um, that we want to end up at the end of this webinar, so we have a, a, a sense of our space, we have a sense of our priorities, uh, we have a sense of our mini projects. So I want to ask you in the comments box, what do you think should be the next step? What do you think we should do next in order to arrive at our project chart? Anybody wants to discard the non-collection items? Actually, it actually brings up an interesting, uh, an interesting point: is that um, when you're working in your own institution. Um, we, we are working kind of with, uh, with a host institution, and Rachel and I are not part of that institution staff. And so we're doing this at a distance, and so we're having to plan without really being that familiar with the institution. So we're relying, we're relying heavily on Susan. Um, but if you're working within an institution, um, it actually is sometimes necessary to remove the non-collection items from the space even before you do all the planning, because that really gives you an idea of how much space that stuff is taking up and how much space you can free up. And so um, that, that's, I'm glad people are saying this, because that is actually correct in most cases, is that you do end up having to take out that stuff that you know doesn't belong there first. And then you can really see what you have left. And then, um, but what we're going to do, because we are not part of this institution, <laughs> is that we're going to, um, see, first thing, uh, we're going to actually, to get to our project chart, we're going to have to define what the various things that we need to do are. So we want to get to the project chart, which is a tool that will help us to plan our work for that day, to get to that chart, we need to understand what needs to happen. So here is a list of priorities. But it really doesn't tell us what the different people in the workshop group are going to be doing. It just tells us generally where we want to end up at the end of the day. But so if we take our first part, which everyone said correctly, that is going to be to get rid of the non-collection items. So there will be collection items that will be probably relocated um, if, they're still, if they still have some use, and some non-collection items which are going to be discarded. So um, what I'd like to do right now is to take you through the process of how we are planning this in the background, like in the background. <laughs> 
how we're planning our workshop, and maybe you can um, use some of these tools in order to plan your own reorg. So by taking our priorities, I'm starting to think about, well, what needs to happen if I relocate and discard non-collection items? What needs to happen? So first thing is, where do I put them? So maybe I need to set up a space for the non-collection items in the semi-basement or in the sub-basement. I need to set up a space where those things will go, one thing that needs to happen. And maybe I need to designate an area where I put all the rubbish. So maybe that's outside somewhere where the garbage collection happens, or maybe there's a garbage room, or maybe there's an area where all of the other uh, garbage gets put so <clears throat> or recycled. And so um, I need to, to designate where is the stuff that is not collection, that we are not keeping, where is that going? Um, that includes also things that maybe Susan wants to donate. Um, then we want to probably designate an area where we're going to put all the things that we are not sure what they are. So uh, some of the items in that storage area might be clearly collection. Some of them might be clearly non-collection. And some of them are, hmm, I don't know what they are. And so we might need to dig a little bit deeper into the documentation to, uh, to clarify what the status of those objects is. And so we don't want to do that during our workshop, but we do want to identify what these objects are and to put them somewhere where they can be addressed later. So that's going to be our designation, our de sorry, our area for unknowns. And then we probably at some point need to relocate the non-collection, including the rubbish the semi-basement. Uh, sorry, the rubbish will go into the area for rubbish, but to relocate the non-collection items into the semi-basement. Oh, and probably we'll need to identify first. Actually, this probably needs to happen before anything else. We'll need to identify what is collection, what is non-collection, and what are the unknowns. So some of this will be happening while we're taking things out, but there's definitely some things that can be done beforehand. And we've asked Susan, to go through her storage area and to start tagging things that she knows to be non-collection. So she's not touching them, she's not removing them, but she's identifying them so it'll make it easier next Monday um, to work uh, in the collection with uh, people that are not familiar with the space to know exactly, oh, this one we know non-collection, we can take it out. Um, and so this probably needs to happen at the beginning. Okay, so let's move on to our second priority, which is to create storage systems that are better adapted to the collection's needs. This is our before. Let's take away all the stuff that's on the floor or not in units. I want to show you what the, <laughs> what the configuration of the, the ceiling is. It's a groin vault. So it's a, a two barrel vaults uh, that intersect uh, Center, right? So it's this is kind of how the the ceiling is, uh, is is structured, and so this is an additional challenge for us because very we can't put things. We have to make sure that um, our whatever we decide to put in the center, uh, we might not be able to put it here. So we have to really uh, be mindful of the height uh, of um, of the ceiling in various locations. This is our current situation, and this is where the, the vaults are more or less uh, the same ceiling height. But after here, in this area, it starts to drop. Over here, in this area, it starts to drop. Here, it starts to drop. So we basically have this kind of cross shape. Uh, where the ceiling height is more or less consistent. And so we, where we have to be mindful that this is where we can get the, we can use the, the vertical space in the space uh, most efficiently. What we proposed is to actually remove several of the units that are in there right now um, that are not um, suited for the types of objects that are in the space. So perhaps the slotted units are, are great for things that are, need to be stored flat, but they're not um, ideal for 
uh, the types of uh, 3D objects, uh, the, the textiles, uh, all the different types of objects that we have, they're not ideal for those kinds of objects. So what we're proposing is to actually add some metal shelving in the middle here. And this, you'll remember, is the axis where <laughs> Uh, the ceiling height is at its highest, so we can get the most out of the, the space if we install it this way. And these are the two units that are already in the space right now, which we'll be keeping um, because they are perfectly fine. And then we're going to be keeping a few units because those can be used to store the frames that we have. going to be giving a donation. Um, so if we're thinking about what needs to happen in order for us to implement this plan, um, we will need to adapt those units that we're keeping, these ones here. We're going to be uh, needing to adapt those for the framed units. So for the framed works. So we said that some of them we might want to flip on their side in order to be storing things vertically. Uh, we might want to pad some of the bottoms of those units uh, to uh, protect the frames. And so this is all you know, adapting those units, but we're keeping them. Um, also, we're going to be removing all of the collections in that space and sorting them by type and category, as I mentioned. So we'll be doing that while we're taking things out. Um, We're going to be also setting some temporary uh, storage locations, uh, which are uh, probably going to have to happen before this happens. So we're going to have to decide what are temporary storage locations for flags, temporary storage locations for, co for uniforms, temporary storage locations for frames. Uh, we have to identify what those are and to set them up before we start removing our collection. So this is all part of the brainstorming kind of thing that happens when you're trying to figure out what needs to happen. So it's not very organized, usually. You start just putting things down. I use uh, sticky notes or post-it notes to do this. Um, so that's why they're not really in order right now. Um, oh, we're getting storage units donated, so we need to assemble those at some point. So those need to be assembled. Uh, we're going to relocate all the unwanted units that uh, are great, but not for this collection. Uh, we're going to be relocating them to the semi or the sub-basement. Uh, and then we need to prepare all the various object types for storage. So that's the flags, the framed works, the uniforms. So all of those need to be packaged or uh, rehoused and prepared for storage. So that also needs to happen at some point. Uh, probably the units that we're keeping in the space, we might want to give them a quick wipe down to remove dust. If there is any. Uh, oh, probably also vacuuming the space. When you remove everything from a room that's been filled with collections, there's usually a little vacuuming to do, so we might want to do that as well. For the third priority, which was to have no objects directly on the floor, there's nothing really to do for that. Um, it's just Keep in mind that anything we do, we have to make sure that no objects will be stored on the floor. Number four, create a location system. So this is to enable us to find any object within three minutes at the end, uh, once the uh, locations have been recorded. So um, for this, we'll need to write our location codes on the units and shelves probably want to draw a final storage furniture layout with the codes written on them so you can know exactly where, which locations are where. So that might be something to do. So I can't really think of anything else right now. There might be other things that are involved in this, but for the moment, that's sufficient. So all of these then end up being a bunch of sticky notes that you have. Perhaps I'm using table or a uh, big flip chart paper. Um, so I just kind of stick them on there and start thinking about, uh, oh, perhaps sometimes what happens is that you have this big thing, this big task, which is actually maybe a bunch of small tasks that need to be unpacked. 
So preparing various object types for storage is quite a large task. That's most of what we need to do <laughs> that day. So maybe I want to separate that into smaller tasks. So what I'm going to do now is, well, we want to roll the flags. We want to box the flag, some flags. We want to box some smaller uniforms. We want to wrap some maps. We want to box some large uniforms. We want to place 3D objects on the shelves. Then I can get rid of that one and I have my smaller tasks that are broken down into smaller chunks. That's good enough, I think, for now. So I'm going to start by showing you um, what comes next, which is, this is all nice, but we need to know what we have to start with, what we need to do first, and what we need to do last. And maybe there's some things that can happen at the same time, and maybe there's some things that need to happen before other things can happen. So like dependencies, so I absolutely have to do this before I can do this. Um, so the ones that I'm giving uh, a spot on this table or this piece of paper are going to become blue. So we've already said that one of the first things that we want to ask Susan to do, even before we get there, is to identify what is collection, what is non-collection, and what are the unknowns. We are asking her just to focus on the non-collections because those will be easier than to um, at the beginning now. Um, probably designating an area for rubbish can happen at the beginning. Doesn't need to, nothing needs to happen before that. Uh, we can also designate an area for unknowns, probably at the beginning. We can set up a space for non-collections in the semi-basement or sub-basement. I think that can happen fairly at the beginning. We can probably relocate non-collections to the semi-basement Locate non-collections to the semi-basement. We need areas. Column. They're actually in a second column because these have to be these have to be done before these can happen. Okay. This is why they're being stacked in the second column. Like remove all collections and sort by type or category. Um, before we remove the collections, we need to have identified areas where the collections are going. Set up temporary locations. Now, as I'm going through the different notes, or the different uh, sticky notes, then I'm putting them in the right column, depending on when they need to happen. Uh, removing rubbish, where should that go? That can happen probably after we've designated an area for the rubbish. Removing the new storage units. I'm going to place it in the first column because I think that can happen at the very beginning while other people are working on different things like designating the areas for different types of collections. That can happen at the beginning. A, a one team can be working on that. So it doesn't really need anything before. Nothing really needs to happen before that. Locating unwanted units to the semi-basement probably happen after. We need to remove what's in the units, or we relocate the empty units. Get the point according to what they're here. I'm just going to explain this one. So, um, boxing large uniforms and boxing small uniforms um, not that different of a task. They're just different sizes of uniforms, but they can probably be the same task. So, we're just going to call it box uniforms. We're going to be boxing flags, flags, shelves, and at the very end, we're going to be drawing our storage furniture layout with the station codes 
and writing the location codes on the units. This is more or less what our day is going to look like, but we're not going to end there because at the end we need to celebrate as well. So we need to make a little room for that. But basically, this is what the order of the tasks is going to start to look like. And where I have the lines here indicates where um, there are kind of hard, um, the hard lines mean that um, in that column can't happen before whatever is in the previous column happens. I'm going to start also to assign colors to them. Just to give you an idea, when you start um, grouping the tasks that are kind of similar or that can be done by the same team together. The identifying collection and non-collection thing at the beginning because that's what Susan's going to do for us. Assigning colors to the things that are kind of similar, I think can be done by the same team. So as you can see, we already have starting to form an orange team, a green team, a yellow team, and a pink team. Those tasks together. Change on the day of the workshop. Here I removed the line because I, I figured that you know, we don't really need, once we've removed all of the objects from storage, all of these uh, different uh, object type tasks can happen. It doesn't need to wait. We don't need to wait. Um, so because all the things have been removed and they've been placed in the temporary storage locations, and so someone can start working on those right away, we don't need to wait. So I've removed the line there to show you that sometimes you have to re-examine your So again, decide based on your own situation what kind of tasks can be sort of grouped together as one group's work. So we end up with this kind of thing, but this is still not a project chart because we don't know exactly. Uh, it, it's not a very user-friendly format. And so we can convert those little post-it notes into this format. You'll notice that I've put assemble new storage units, and I've given it two, two sections because I think that can take some time sometimes. So it might be a longer task. So if we remove those lines, it's starting to look like what we call a Gantt chart, if you're familiar with that. So it's kind of a project chart that shows all the tasks that can happen at the same time, and then all the tasks that happen afterwards. But for our workshops, what we like to do is to kind of take this, but make it into this format. So basically, we're taking all the content that's in these a list here using this different columns, create these empty, I'm going to do that for all four groups. That allows us to do is when we have our four groups working simultaneously, um, it might be useful sometimes for group green to know what group orange is up to because they're kind of waiting. They're here, but they need this to happen before. and so. It allows us, uh, we ask the participants to fill in the bars, the progress bars, as they've completed a task in order uh, to inform the other groups what they're up to and what needs to be done. We use this as a kind of communication tool during our workshops. And you might find that in your own projects, this might be a good way to track your progress. And it's kind of encouraging uh, you know, to, to fill in the, the progress bars. So that's what we like to do. So this is how we're using it in the workshops. And I think it's some people, uh, some participants who have then implemented their own projects in their own institutions have used the same kind of chart. Um, in their own projects. Also do a chart using Excel. So that's another way, if you're familiar with 
Microsoft Excel or something similar, a spreadsheet program, you can use uh, that to, um, to do your own chart uh, in, as a computer form. So what we want to do now is to look at what could go wrong, because a lot of things can go wrong in a day. And we won't plan for everything, but it's useful to anticipate some of the things, so to kind of do a risk assessment for our project, because sometimes you know, things can be prevented or uh, we can plan ahead. So one th some things we have already addressed. <laughs> so uh, at earlier this week, we were not sure that we were going to be getting the shelving units. And so um, one thing that could go wrong is we have no shelving units. So can we adapt some of the existing units that we have in the space? Can we find other sources of funding? These are all options that we've explored. Um, we weren't sure that we were going to have all the packing materials or rehousing materials. So what materials does the museum have that we can reuse as a temporary solution? So these are kinds of things that we would have checked before. Um, some tasks may take longer than expected. Um, if you have to dismantle storage units in your project, um, these tasks often take longer than you think because uh, there's always that one screw or that one bolt that ends up taking you an hour to unscrew, and that kind of throws everything off. And so um, we uh, will be ready for that to happen by already anticipating that some of the object rehousing tasks might need to be simplified a little bit. Um, we might get fewer people than expected. This is a volunteer project, and maybe people had other commitments that um, on the day they weren't able to attend. So again, I think we'll be ready to scale down some of the project, uh, the object rehousing tasks if we need to. Um, and then we might run out of swing space, because when you empty a room, um, you need space to bring those objects into. And so uh, one of the questions was, will we have that outdoor tent? And Susan has confirmed that we will, so that's great. Uh, and then maybe there's other areas in the building that we'll be looking at to use as temporary swing space. And if there's any shelving units that are empty somewhere that we can use as temporary shelving, that would be also useful. So we'll be looking at all of those options. So these are kind of things that we think maybe could go wrong. And there might be others, but this is the first list. And then what are the possible bottlenecks? So bottlenecks, what's a bottleneck? Well, it's when there's a task that is actually blocking other tasks to happen uh, from happening, so you're all waiting. You're all waiting for something to, to be complete before you can start working, and this is one of the signs that there's a bottleneck where people are just kind of idle and standing there, <laughs> not sure what to do, because you're just waiting for that one thing to happen. So um, in our plan, what we will do with you know there's like three things that possibly could be bottlenecks. So one of them um, designate an area for unknowns. Um, actually, looking at unknowns and trying to determine whether or not it's collection or it's an unknown might take some time sometimes, longer than we think, depending on how many unknowns there are, which we do not know. So it's, it is unknown how many unknowns there are. Uh, and that can take longer than we think. And so uh, we just have to be mindful of that, that that can take more time. Um, assembling the new storage units, uh, depending on how uh, user-friendly these storage units are, and not all of them are as uh, user-friendly. Um, um, and so that might take a bit longer than we think. And that, if people are waiting for the storage units to be assembled uh, because the objects are ready to go back in, then that can be a bottleneck. And so we'll need to make sure that we have sufficient people who have the sufficient, uh, have the required skills to assemble storage units working on that from the very beginning. Um, and then adapting units for the framed works, depending on what we decide to do with that. Um, if we start to, uh, you know, that, those are the kinds of tasks where when you're adapting furniture, I just put that as an example, uh, there could be some things that take longer than expected. And so we don't want to be uh, having people waiting for that. Um, so we have to be ready to simplify if we need to. Are there others? Well, there might be. Um, and so um, I think when we meet with the team next Sunday, a day before the workshop, we'll be going through the plan, maybe kind of revising this, and trying to figure out if there, is, there, are, other, there are other things that could take longer than we think and might block the progress.
Um, and we also, um, when you're working on your own project, we don't want you to forget that um, you know, these issues that we discussed in webinar three uh, about the relative value and the vulnerability and exposure to agents of deterioration also factor into your uh, issues. So although you developed your issues for your project before we looked at this, um, it's important to look at your plans that you drew, and this is an example from one of the participants. So this is showing the location of the value items, and this is showing the, uh, the mapping of the agents of deterioration. So it's important to take this into consideration when you're planning um, your uh, reorg. So also um, incorporating that uh, analysis into your final uh, task list and priorities list for your project. That uh, finishes uh, my part for today. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, our assignments for the next webinar, which is actually a month or so from now, um, which will be the final um, webinar, um, I will ask you to develop your own reorg project chart, but for the physical reorg only. Um, and then I'll ask you to list at least three things that could go wrong with your plan and how you will address these. And then I'll ask you also to identify the possible bottlenecks in your plan, if there are any. So do exactly what uh, we've been talking about today. And uh, the next webinar, which is the last webinar, you'll be able to see, you know, it's nice to do all of this nice planning, and then we'll see in practice what happens if we needed to adapt our plan, if we needed to change our strategy, um, we'll, 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 you'll get to see that. Um, so looking forward to that uh, final webinar. So thanks, thanks everyone, for joining in today. OK, so um, the next uh, webinar is going to be June 5th. So you have a lot of time to get caught up on the homework. Remember, if you're looking to get the Credly badge, you need to listen either live or re the recording of all the re uh, webinars. And you need to do the assignments. So if you have any trouble, let me know. If you have trouble with the course content, put it in the discussions. And other than that, I think we're fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Simon and Rachel. and. Um, Thank you, Mike. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. If there's any questions, please uh, leave them in the discussion in the discussion thread, and we'll answer them. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Audio.